very good afternoon to you all. I would start with the story of a young girl, a very ordinary Bengali middle class young girl, born into a couple who had dreams of changing the society. I mean, that was the 70s Kolkata, right? They were all revolutionaries. They, they wanted to change the system, change the world. And the girl was born to such a couple of parents who flouted uh, caste, who flouted religion, and got together and brought this little girl into the world. When the girl was born, nobody told her that she was, she was ordinary. Nobody told her that she's too dark, she's too thin, or also nobody told her that you can't do this. So, you know, life is always about the half glass, half full, half empty. Sometime around the age of three or four, her grandfather told her, you know, you are the only child in our family. So, what does it matter that you are dark? When you get married, we are going to wrap you up in gold. That was the first time that little girl realized there must be something in her which needs to be compensated with gold, which needs to be wrapped, which needs to be hidden. That was the first time she realized the color of her skin is a drawback, is a weakness to the world outside. Okay, so the girl became a little more introvert. She found solace in stories that she read and the stories she created in her mind. Sometime in a couple of years, she learned classical dancing. Uh, she was into theater and dance because the parents were into theater. They were involved with uh, the Indian People's Theater Association, the IPTA. Again, the, you know, the torch bearers of the social change through culture and theater and music. And so she was into theater, into dance. One day, at a, before a performance, during rehearsals, her dance teacher told her, you know what, Anindita, I think you don't go ahead and take the center stage. I think you should let, I would change the name, you should let Piyu do it. Now, Anindita did not know what was wrong in her performance? She didn't miss a step. She didn't miss her expression. She desperately, you know, searched in her mind. And in the mind of the four or five year old, the only reason she thought was that she was dark, she was not pretty, and she was this thin, struggly girl. And that started working. And uh, whoever in the audience knows how our society as a child grows up tells you you're not good enough, whatever. It could be the color of your skin, it could be your height, it could be your, your weight, but you're never good enough because somebody has to sell a cream, somebody has to sell a potion, somebody has to sell something work on your, working on your insecurity, but unfortunately that little girl didn't know that. So she kind of always was realizing that the compartmentalized that is happening simply because of the look of a little child. And the baggage was increasing. And then suddenly, somebody discovered a story of Tagore called Porir Porishoy. It's a very short story. It was done into a dance drama. And the story said there was this prince who wanted to marry a fairy a beautiful fairy. He would only marry a fair and lovely, beautiful fairy. So he kept searching and somebody told him that, you know, the fairies remain in disguise. You don't really get to see them. And if you actually discover them behind their disguise, they disappear. But the man was adamant. He has to find his, his fairy. So he traveled and traveled and he came to a mountainside where he found a tribal girl fetching water from a mountain brook. And he said, Tumiki Pori, are you the fairy? And she laughed. 
She loved the love of a free spirit, of the mountains, of the forest. And in the laughter, he didn't find the fairy. But he thought maybe she's the one in disguise. So he got married to her, brought her to the palace. And every day, the guy would ask, when are you going to show me your beautiful look, face? When I'm going to see the fairy? The beautiful spirit slowly died inside till one day she said, tomorrow. And she left. She was never found again. Tagore made a revelation to Anindita. The fairy is within you for you to find. The prince, who cares about the prince? You know, it's you which matters. And it was time, you know, those teenage, um, all those flutterings and everything. And she somehow managed through it and reached a place which was actually a magical land, which really gave her the worth, the self-worth, the realization, which was called National School of Drama. Yes, it was the stage. And she was just 17. She was straight out of school. So she was like a lump of clay. And theater, and not just theater, it was the training of theater that made her realize the worth of an individual, of an artist, and the strength in realizing who you are, whatever the world tells you to. And the story, she started writing her own story. Like I said, fortunately, nobody told her that you cannot do it. So coming out of an absolutely more ordinary Bengali family where her mother's salary was 300 rupees and her English medium school fees was 300 rupees, she crossed the threshold of National School of Drama and then realized that theater is not enough of a language to tell the stories that she wants to tell. What is a more powerful, far-reaching language? Cinema. Okay. So... Anindita crossed the threshold of Film Institute, Pune, and got the most powerful tool in the world. Yes, the power of telling a story through audiovisual, through cinema, reaching people. Because when her diploma film reached uh, Berlin, like they were telling the places the film has been to, Barkha, a 22 minute film. And you won't believe it, it was the most traumatic moment to realize that the film copy that had reached Berlin had reached without subtitles. It was a Hindi film, casting Adil Hussain and Jaya Shil Ghosh, uh, both NSDNs, very powerful actors. And I was, I, Anandita, me, was, I mean, I was crying. I was standing in the in the corridor, in the wings, and I was crying. Nobody would understand the language of my film. And the film began. Every moment, people had smiled, laughed, gasped, and sighed. When they understood the language, they did the same when they did not. And that was the moment the 21, 22 year old girl realized the power of storytelling through the weapon called cinema and never let it go. <laughs> and the storyteller, because of the journeys, gets to meet people from all walks of life. Like a few of them are going to speak on stage today. In Chennai, there's this festival held, which is called, um, it's the Aravan Festival. I don't know if you're aware of it. It's a place close to Chennai, near Velupuram, called Kuvagam, where from all over the world, transsexuals, transvestites, people fighting gender identities, trying to find who they are, come once a year. And Aravan, who happens to be uh, a son of Arjun, he was sacrificed before the Kurukshetra. He wanted to marry before he dies. He was sacrificed. Who would marry a, a man and be a widow next day? So Krishna, it's supposed, the story goes, turned himself into a woman 
and got married to Aravan. And the next day, when Aravan was beheaded ceremoniously, Krishna, he performed the rites of a widow and turned back into a man. So all these women are people who trying to fight the woman within them, fight to bring out the women within them, flock to this place once a year. That was where I met Asha. Asha lives the life of a man, 364 days of her life. And just for that one day of the festival, she becomes a woman. A beautiful woman. You know, Asha made me realize that something I had taken for granted, most of us in the audience who were born as women do that, is that identity of a woman, you know, our body, our, our femininity, however we represent it, we take it for granted. And all my childhood and my teenage life, I've been fighting because I was dark, I was thin, I was not pretty enough. Doesn't matter. Asha was just fighting to be a woman 364 days of her life. When I tell Asha's story, you know, I rewrite my story. I traveled around the world, I backpacked around Europe, I climbed the Great Wall of China, I took a night cruise, everything that I wanted to do alone, alone, because that's the best way to do it. And then I realized I have only one life. And in this one life, I'm a woman. And I have a magic given to me by nature, is I can create a life. I didn't want to let that go. But I told you that the thing that my grandfather told when I was four years old, that I have to be wrapped in gold to compensate for my skin color. And then I saw my aunts being paraded day after day uh, in front of possible husbands. And the humiliation the women go through, that marriage market, doesn't matter how educated you are, doesn't matter which class of society you're coming from. And in fact, that story I turned into a film that they were mentioning about Shadharun May. It was my tribute to Tagore. Tagore wrote a poem called Shadharun May some 70, 80 or maybe 90 years ago. And uh, society has not let the extremely ordinary middle class girl verge too much out of that periphery. Otherwise, we would not be fighting for just to be out on the streets, just to be safe, just to live the life we want in 2019, on the throes of 2020. So the Shadharon May, it, I'm still trying to write her story, the Shadharon May on Indita. And so I decided to be a mother. I didn't have a man in my life. But I had some good doctor friends. They were huge support. They told me, science can make, let me become a mother. And thankfully, the law of the country also allows me to be a mother without a man in tow, without a signature on a marriage certificate of two people. I mean, I have nothing against marriage, nothing against men. It's just that I would like to juggle the chronology of it. I believe in love. I believe in all of that. But I wanted to be a mother more. And the biological clock was going tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. I was 35. So I bought a cup of sperms. And I went through a process called IVF. I became a mother. Media tells me that I'm probably one of the first few who've done it. Doesn't matter. Yes, the journey was tough. That part of chapter of the story, tough because you're alone. You're alone in your success not just in your success, there are a lot of people. When I delivered my baby, it was front page news. Everybody just showered me, me and my baby still with love. But the process, driving every day to take your hormone injections. You do the blood test after 15 days and you realize you failed. And again, next month, you drive back to the doctor. The first time, I had a painful miscarriage. And you know what I was thinking when I was bleeding and I was driving myself alone to the clinic? 
I was thinking, this pregnancy is lost, but let me live. I want to live. I want to live through this day. I want to live this day and tomorrow. Tomorrow I can have my child. And I did. February, I lost my first baby. And 3rd May 2013, another embryo was placed inside me and born. And my son was born on 21st November the same year. Ogni Snato. Ogni Snato, again, has a story. When I was in the labor room fighting my pain, pain and my, my scary thoughts, I wrote him a letter saying that, you, and the last line said, you are swimming through a river of fire. <laughs> it is. The world is tough. I know I've been telling you that the world is beautiful and everything, but I think inside it's more safe, secure. Don't be in a hurry to come out. <laughs> Take your time. And you're come swimming through a river of fire when you're born. I'll call you Ogni Snato or Ogni Snata. There's a boy and there's Ogni Snato. <laughs> but the story is not over. It's <laughs> and actually, I wake up every morning and start writing a chapter. That's what I would like to say because my story is nothing very special. All I have been trying to tell you through the, that thin, dark little girl to today, Ogni Snato's mother, and trying to get back to making films is I'm very ordinary still. But you know what makes me special to myself every day? I can smile every day. I can smile through whatever life throws at me. I keep telling people, don't lose that smile. And yes, that defines me. And I'm waiting for the day my face will be full of laugh lines. And then I don't have to smile all the time. People will look at me and say, oh, this lady smiled through her life. Look at her laugh lines. Look at the crow feet around her eyes. Yes. Because the ordinary girl's fight is really, really tough. I'll end with the grim part because fighting the grimness is probably the toughest job for each of us. Every 68 minutes in India, and this is the National Crime Report Bureau statistics, a girl is either killed or forced to commit suicide for dowry. Something as horrible, as illegal, everything in every 68 minutes. My story is thousands of girls put together and making a film. And every day I live through the life of those girls, I realized tomorrow has to be better. I have to tell another better story, another story tomorrow. And that story, I'll be waiting to hear from you. Thank you.